Hello and welcome to our virtual rhinoplasty meetings. My name is Dr. Cameron McIntosh and I'm the president of SORSA or the Society of Rhinoplasty Surgeons of South Africa. So during the coronavirus lockdown period, we decided to have bi-weekly Zoom meetings. We specifically chose teachers from around the world to be able to cover many topics. Unfortunately, due to patient confidentiality, we can't actually show you the real talks. However, the very interesting interactive question and answer sessions is what we're going to be showing you. We want to give a shout out to our colleagues around the world fighting coronavirus. Please look after yourselves and be safe. So I'm not going to say anything more. Enjoy the show. For episode 16, Dr. Jeff Marcus gave us a such an insightful lecture on comprehensive cleft rhinoplasty. Jeff, thank you. That's, um, that's great. You know that last point you made about that they don't come to you for practice? Uh, Stuart and I last year, actually, he flew up from Cape Town and we spent eight hours doing a complex case together. And I think... There's a lot to be said to work together in teams on this. We, it's not a normal rhinoplasty, right? Sure. So, so guys, what I'm going to do is I'm opening up for any questions. So you can send them through YouTube or you can type them on the chat here. Whilst you're busy doing that, I'd like to remind you that you can get CME points for this. So fill in the, Amir's just put on the evaluation there for the CME um, and questions you may have. And also we're just doing a, a, a little study ourselves on, on all these webinars and how they're going. So I'm going to jump ahead and, and start opening up some of the, the, the chats that have come up here. Um, so Jeff, uh, Mohammed wants to know, what is your anatomic landmark for, for percutaneous osteotomy? Anatomic landmark, uh, for, yeah, where I, where I position uh, my, my entry site. Um, I typically will go about five millimeters above the caudal edge of the nasal bone, avoiding... Um, uh, uh, avoiding the inferior most uh, uh, portion of it. So I'm going to start uh, about you know, five millimeters high on the, on the nasal bone, and then uh, I'll be five millimeters behind it with the incision. I just want to make sure I have access to the, the whole length. I think that there's some latitude as to where the incision can be. Um, you know, the skin can be moved. Okay. Um, a, a question from Shaw. He'd like to know if an adult presents with a cleft palate and a cleft nose associated with, how do you correct both in one setting? Personally, I wouldn't because it's, it, it would be, you know, for me, it takes, it takes me a, you know, about four and a half to five hours to do a comprehensive cleft you know, rhinoplasty like the type that I'm showing here. And it would take me on an adult to do the palate. It would take me probably another, and you know, he may, you know, if you, you can try to speed through these things, but I feel like if they're not done, if, if you don't give each one of them the proper amount of time and attention, then you're not able to do each one uh, properly um, and thoroughly. So I, I wouldn't necessarily do them, I wouldn't do them together. I first determine whether or not the patient will benefit from having a cleft palate repair, because if they've left, it depends, if they've lived their life to that point and have no, some people surprisingly have um, few difficulties. And so talking to the patient to decide whether they want to do it or the, and whether they would benefit from that and then time, and then sequencing it. Um, I don't believe that in terms of the palate, it makes too much difference if it's a, say, a cleft of the secondary palate or something like that. But I don't think it would make too much difference which one went first. It does make a difference for patients who are having uh, jaw surgery, and there's some controversy here where some people uh, believe that those can be done together. And I think it's probably okay too. Some you know, great surgeons like that, uh, Derek Steinbacher, uh, can do that. Um, but in, in my practice, at least, I would do, you know, uh, jaw advancement. I do, do first because it sets the base of the nose in a new position. And I reassess with what I'm going to do with the nose and then build upon that foundation. Thank you. Um, Peter Hellings from Leuven in Belgium. He's got a couple of questions. He wanted to know in terms of what do you use for grafting material? Um, it's not too much different. Again, like I, I look at these, these are they're rhinoplasty operations. So my sequence of choice is the same as what um, probably you all would do too. You know, if you had a, particularly if it was a secondary first step, determine whether or not there's a likelihood that you'll have a cartilage available, depending on what has previously been done. Sometimes it's hard to know what's been done in these kids because a lot of the surgeons who have done the prior operations were not may not have been rhinoplasty surgeons. Whereas we all do a pretty good job when we do an operation is that we dictate and we indicate how much of the septum we took and where we took it from and how much we left behind. We tried, I do that. I think, you know, most, I think a lot of us do. Um, it, it may be hard to figure that out because something may have been done and it may not have even been documented well. So you try to figure it out. Um, 
then you go down and you, you talk to the patients about the, the next sequence. If you don't have septal cartilage available or if it, if it might not be available, and these are skeletal and mature people, they're not these children we're talking about, um, I would then talk to them about rib, rib graft if we don't believe that there would be enough structural material that's there. For rib graft, you know, you have autologous and you also have your, your, your frozen um, uh, processed uh, grafts that a lot of people are, are favoring now. I don't, have, I don't have a problem with either one. Um, and I do use um, I do use the frozen uh, cadaveric graft sometimes, but I, I make the decision with the patient. And the only time I ever really try to persuade them one way or another is if it's a very obese patient, a patient that's going to be it's going to require a very large incision and and make me lose all kinds of sweat and 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 be and be upset during the cartilage harvest. So if if I feel like it's going to be a very difficult harvest, then I might have ask them to consider the cadaveric. Yeah, Peter's got a second question. He'd like to know your comments on the patient's satisfaction functionally compared to cosmetic after your surgeries. Uh, that's Which a great one question. Does yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what I what I had noticed over, you know, all, over the years, starting from when I was a resident and early on, and I mentioned before about this variability in terms of the functional um, uh, outcomes, um, it is hard to predict always what the patients will say they feel because sometimes they don't understand themselves. They don't know what they're feeling. It takes them a while to get used to it. So if you wanna know what the, subject, the subjective outcome of the functional operation is, you sometimes have to ask them two or three years later because if you've corrected somebody's um, airway completely and thoroughly, and I can tell you this by having, you know, with computational fluid dynamic of the before and the after, and they have, uh, you know, a ton of air going through. You can see there's a ton of air going through sides. Sometimes early on, they don't perceive it. So because they've lived their entire life being obstructed or nearly obstructed, basically not, not just since adolescence, but since they were children. So it does take them a while to kind of figure that out. And they don't necessarily stop mouth breathing at night right away. It takes them, you know, again, up to a couple, it could be two years, three years later. And I think at that point, if you ask them, then I, um, if, the, if the surgery has been thorough, then the results have been good um, and, the, and, they, and they report it if you ask later. The aesthetic outcomes, most people, uh, the majority of them are very, very satisfied relatively early. Um, and it's dependent also on how severe the problem was. So, you know, of course, like anything, your most severe patients will probably be the most satisfied early on. The ones that have more subtle deformities you know, may, you know, be, be the ones they may, they may do like your, your typical rhinoplasty patient will do and say, well, what about that? And what about that? And, you know, point to all the yeah. little things. Okay, great. Um, I, I lost a couple of the questions right on early. So if any of you still have questions from early on or Stuart, if you can see some of them, please, please could you maybe ask those? I'm going to ask a question here. This is quite interesting from Vishnu. who wants to know, how do you correct the premaxillary defect in the floor of the nose? Yeah, um, that that is that's a, that's a hard question because the the real answer is have there be no premaxillary defect in the floor of the nose. Make sure there won't be one. If if it's your patient, then at the time of the palate repair, I'm gonna just I'm trying to be clear here. The time of the palate repair, do everything you possibly can to repair the nasal floor all the way up to. Uh, the uh, the alveolar way up to the alveolar cleft, including the primary palate. It can repair, and that's true in the lip repair too. In your lip repair, in combination with the palate in infancy, if you are focusing getting the nasal floor repaired properly, which you absolutely can do, then you will not have to deal with this later on. If you have a hole, if you have fistula and so forth, and you're now seven to nine years old at which point we're gonna be considering doing an alveolar bone graft to fill in the alveolar cleft. Any residual fistula that you have there is, should be repaired and you should try to raise the nasal base with the alveolar bone graft. You wanna, if you can raise the base, create in a, watertight, in a watertight area where the nasal mucosa and the oral mucosa are completely repaired, when you get to the time that you're doing a rhinoplasty, you will not have to deal with premaxillary defect. If you have that, and if you're talking about a piriform deficiency, let's say, and maybe that may be what he means, if it's a piriform deficiency at the time of the rhinoplasty, some people advocate using implants, like for example, you know, MedPOR. I have had very bad um, luck 
with MedPore implants. I've had a couple of exposures in that location. It might be me, might be my technique. I stopped using um, um, uh, MedPore implants for that. If I have somebody with a significant deficiency at the piriform, I would consider bone graft with a single lag screw. Um, and where you get the bone graft from is, you know, whatever you're most comfortable with. Thank you. Um, Needs has a question. He'd like to know, in your opinion, would it be preferable to do a lower third rhinoplasty at the time of cleft repair or wait until adolescence for the primary rhinoplasty in order to re reduce the number of procedures? Great question. Um, this is another one where you're going to have a lot of controversy and there will be plenty of people probably who, who disagree with me. Um, the philosophy that I ascribe to is one that's, um, that, you, that is, I attribute it to a guy named David Fisher, who's a, a cleft surgeon in Toronto, Canada, and who I know has lectured in South Africa numerous times. Um, the, the basic philosophy there is that what can you do at the time of the, of the lip repair that will not create damage for later? What can you safely do? First of all, if, you're doing, uh, if you have availability of having somebody to do nasoalveolar molding, if you have an orthodontist who can do nasal alveolar molding, it makes all the difference in the world. Uh, let's just say you don't have that person. That's fine. There are still things that you can do. You may end up doing more, being a little more aggressive if you don't have NAM. If you have NAM, you don't have to do much aggressive at all. The only thing you really think you need to do is one is from the inside, release the lateral cruise at the piriform so that it will come up. That you basically, you're only, you're gonna, you're gonna basically spread on either side of the, of the lateral cruise where it attaches to the piriform and then come through and just release it so that the ala can come out and be and inward. You need to mobilize it because those are gonna be, if you didn't have NAM, you have a wide cleft so that needs to come in. That's the thing you need to do to release the ala so that it will come medially. The other thing that you can do is that you can do a caudal septal repositioning. Um, so if you take, if you, if you release the caudal septum from, uh, from the premaxilla, and this is again on a unilateral cleft, and then you can shift it over and secure it to the periosteum in the midline, you can do that without disrupting um, uh, much at all of the, of the caudal septum. Really, it's just the anterior, maybe 10 millimeters, if that, and then secure it well in the periosteum with one or two sutures of like something like something that will hold like a 5 PDS or something like that. Those two maneuvers will correct the, the ALR base. The, the, the ALA will be able to come medially. The caudal septum will, come, will be centralized, which means your columella will be more vertical. You can also secure the columella in a vertical position the same way. After the caudal septum has been secured in the midline, then take do, from the inside, take a stitch along the foot plates, and you can secure them right in the midline as well. And by the, at the end of the operation, your columella will be perfectly straight. The question about like, do you come over the, you know, how much can you do on the lower third, like as far as coming over the tip? I think it's very reasonable to take your scissors from laterally and come over the dome, basically in the scroll area and do it mm -hmm. and spread over the scroll. The reason why I say this is because I already described how the lateral cruise by being pulled is coming down like a bucket handle. It's being pulled and rotated or counter rotated down, right? So what it's done is that it has attenuated the scroll the scroll is supposed to be, you know, imbricated upon itself. When you pull the lateral cruise, it's attenuating the scroll. So if you go from lateral to medial and make us and come over the scroll and spread carefully, so you're not damaging the cartilage. Now on the inside, you can put an, a couple of mattress sutures to basically imbricate the scroll back onto itself, which basically is going to push, it'll pull the ala upward. And you want to overcorrect that just a little bit. Those maneuvers that I just described, and I hope they made sense, um, are things that will create no damage for the rhinoplasty surgeon later on. And in my practice now that I've been, you know, I've been at, at, in my location at Duke, I've been here for 19 years almost, and that's more or less what I've done. And in all of my cases, I've done, I believe, three or four intermediate rhinoplasties, where meaning the age seven to 10 group, three or four where I've worked on the tip before later on, of course, in, in, when they get to skeletal maturity, then I'll do a comprehensive, you know, septorhinoplasty. And I don't withhold that. I don't tell the families, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do the tip. I refuse to do this tip. I would do it if they want me to, but they haven't asked me to. Mm -hmm. So the idea is try to make the nose as good as you can at the first, at that first operation so that they will not want you to do anything until the kids are teenagers. 
Great. Jeff, there's time for two more questions. Angela wants to know, do you use ALOL rim grafts? Love them. Yeah, I, I do. I don't think I showed it in that case. Um, I, I, tend, I, love, I like ALOL rim grafts in most of my rhinoplasties, my other, my cosmetic and functional rhinoplasties. And, and the cleft ones, um, I don't necessarily do them as often as I do in the other cases. Um, I think just because I think sometimes the shapes are a little bit different and I feel like it's going to stick out on the cleft side. It may create like a, a knuckle or a notch if it's too long. So I do like them, but I'm, I'm probably a little bit more judicious about using them in the cleft cases. And I don't tend to use articulated rim grafts like, like Rick does. I don't know. Maybe I, I should think about it. I, I, maybe I should. It's just that the ALA is so distorted and sometimes scarred that I, I'm afraid that I don't think they're going to work as well. Okay, the last question here is, um, the medial Chris is short on the cleft side. How do you lengthen it? Um, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of people, I know a lot of people say this and they swear by it and they, and they argue about it. Um, the medial cruise isn't necessarily short on the cleft side. Um, when you lift up, when you lift the ala from laterally, it's pulled, the whole thing's pulled out laterally. To say that the medial cruise is short means you're, you're saying, what is it, congenitally short? It's not congenitally short. The whole thing is being pulled posterior laterally. So it's like doing a steal. You just have to bring everything that was lateral back medial. It's not that the medial cruise was short. It's not congenitally deficient. It was just located in another area. Cool. So Jeff, um, this is, uh, we, our time's up here. Um, I think what's so amazing about what you spoke about here, I mean, obviously you've got a gift as a teacher, but the research that you guys are doing is absolutely phenomenal, man. Um, so Thanks. thank you. Thank you for sharing that with everybody. So I, 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 I want to ask you my last question, and this is more not just on cleft, but uh, rhinoplasty, but rhinoplasty generally. You've got guys who are still residents. You've got guys who've been in the game for a long time. Your three most important things with rhinoplasty, what are those? Oh, my goodness. Um, uh, from a technique point of view or philosophically? Anything, anything. Three things, philosophically maybe. Your, okay. what, what is your... First thing is um, uh, being a rhinoplasty surgeon requires commitment and it doesn't matter what, you know, what your background is specifically that gets you there, but you have to recognize where your deficiencies are and make up for those deficiencies. And the best way to do that is by having good friends, good colleagues, and paying attention to what everyone else is doing and being honest with yourself. So in my case, um, you can watch my talk and, you, and, and, and a lot of people have asked, you know, I've gotten invited to many, you know, otolaryngology things because people, many people think I'm an otolaryngologist. I'm not, I'm a plastic surgeon. I didn't have any training in otolaryngology, but I knew that that was my deficiency. So I made sure to make up for it by studying and, you know, and by studying extra hard, make, having good colleagues like you and Stu work together. I learned from my rhinologist who I used to operate with all the time. Um, we all work coll collegially and collaboratively together to try to make sure that we fully understand these things. Same with you know, being, you know, not everybody can be a cleft surgeon and a rhinoplasty surgeon. So you have to understand where your deficiencies are and pay attention to try to make up for those things um, and then share. Um, so that's one is um, uh, knowing yourself, knowing your abilities, trying to address the things you need. Um, I guess the second would be that um, everybody has a learning curve with everything. And rhinoplasty is probably the, the longest lasting and steepest learning curve probably of anything. And we all have to be honest about like what we're doing and what our problems are, especially you know, so when we're presenting and anybody who, who would you know, portray that they have no problems and that every case is perfect um, is probably not somebody you need to really learn from. The, the, the educators are the ones that are, that are telling you when did they have a problem and how did they deal with the problem and they're not afraid to show you an example of it. So um, kind of you know, thinking about this from like this position of like the learning curve. There's a guy named Lauren Rosenfield in San Francisco who um, talks about this a lot. Um, I think and I think those are the main things. And then also just um, as painful as it is, you have to look at your results from a while back, you know. And you have I mean it is sometimes excruciating um, <laughs> to see some of the stuff from before and like you know, like I said though, it's that's that is how you learn. Um, and so, you know, you got to do it. Awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you, man. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you. I know you guys are back at work and here you are taking an hour and a half off to spend with these South Africans and colleagues around the world. Um, we appreciate it. And to everybody who's been watching tonight, thank you so much for watching. Next week's our last week. We've got Nazim, 
um, on Tuesday, speaking just about secondary rhinoplasty. So eight o'clock on Tuesday night, we'll see all of you again. Jeff, thanks very much. Eh? Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. Cheers see you, Stu. Good to see you. Cheers, Jeff. You too, man. Bye.